Hi guys, welcome back to Red Dog Gaming, where today we are bringing you another Sparta video, slightly different from the Let's Play, a Sparta video on how to start as Sparta in RTR Imperium Surrectum for Rome Total War Remastered. Now, Sparta is a great faction, and you can check out my Let's Play down in the description down below, where we've got pretty far so far, uh, taking all of Greece and the Balkans. Um, so, I thought it was a good time to talk about a guide to Sparta, how it is as a faction, and the way this is going to work, we're going to go over the positives and negatives, the generic ones to start with as the first section, then we're going to look at the building roster, then the unit roster, and then there's a little guide on how to start as Sparta right at the end. So here is the opening screen of Sparta, and I thought I'd just set the scene for Sparta, that you will have seen this before if you've watched my Let's Play. Long gone are the glory days of yesteryear in Sparta. Once it was the former city-state in all Greece. It defied the Persian Empire and triumphed in the war over the Athenians, and its famous warriors were feared and admired throughout the world. Now, however, it is but a shadow of itself. Look to rebuild, but be wary of the upstart Achaeans, and you might need help against the Antigonids. So, this is your starting position, guys, and we're going to talk about this position a lot more in detail when we go on to the how to start section. But first things first, let's talk about a few of the generic positives and negatives of Sparta to wet the whistle. Then we'll go into a little bit more detail of them when we go through the sections. So let's start with the positives. Of course, you are Sparta, number one. So you're pretty cool. And you feel cool playing Sparta. I mean, that is the biggest positive to Sparta, to be honest. No, I'm joking, guys. But it is a positive. Sparta is cool. <laughs> you start with an army. Unlike some of the other Hellenic cities, like I believe Athens only starts with a few troops, like three troops in the city. Um, so you do start with a considerable army. Both your kings uh, have really good infantry bodyguards, so you can do some real damage with those guys, as well as the Perioikoi Hoplitae that you uh, get, and the Spartan Homoioi at the start as well. So you get plenty of... Uh, of troops to start with. It doesn't seem a lot, but I can promise you these troops can do a lot of damage if you use them correctly. On to number three. So you start with two rebel cities right next to you, and if you are clever and the Achaeans don't really move too much, then you should be able to take both Megalopolis and Argos within one turn or two turns, depending on whether your spy can open the gates for you. So that is a really big benefit because a lot of these other cities, other city-states in Greece, don't actually start with rebels next to them. They start next to factions, so they must engage in war straight away. Whereas you can bide your time for a couple of turns at least to try and uh, get this bit of the peninsula and stabilize your economy. Um, so, yeah, that is the fourth positive as well, guys. There's no immediate enemies for you, although the Antigonids and Achaeans are right next to you. And of course, Athens is across the strait here, which you can actually walk across uh, in this game. So, Athens technically does border you once you've taken Argos. So let's talk about the negatives a little bit as well. So you lack cavalry. You lack good cavalry all through the game, up to late game. You do get a cavalry general after the Cleomenes reforms. However, that general's really good, but your Spartan cavalry, which you have throughout the game, which we'll go over in the unit roster, is not the greatest, guys. It's not a great cavalry unit. What I would recommend is getting cavalry from Larissa because they have Thessalian lancers over here at Larissa. Not that you can recruit from the town, but as mercenaries. And there's a, uh, a recruitment pool of mercenaries here. So get those guys rather than your Spartan cavalry. So you start with a weak monetary position as well. So that's number two. I'm losing a lot of money. Even if we get this up to very high, which gives us minus 1% population growth, which isn't great, you're still losing a huge amount of money. So we'll talk about how to combat that in the how to start situation. You also start with a bit of a lack of family members, guys. So if we go here, we have Areus and we have Eudimus, Eudamidas. 
uh, who are both the kings. There's combined dual kings in Sparta, if you don't know about that, guys. Um, and Aureus does have two children ready to come of age, but Eudemidas only has one that's zero. So you actually start with quite a lack of family members. But this is the same for all these small uh, factions that don't start with a lot of territories. So you just want to be careful and make sure that Eudemidas and Aureus, when you're fighting these battles, don't die. Um, because if they do die, you could be in for an early game exit, an early game destruction of your nation. So watch out for that. Of course, Sparta, uh, Sparta is small as well, small faction. But a lot of these guys are small factions. But we're not talking about a faction that's the size of Rome, Carthage, the Seleucids, Ptolemies. You know, even the Antigonids start with quite a few territories. So you do start with just a one province. What we would call a one province minor in a paradox game. Um, the other negative that you have as your starting position is that Corinth and Athens provide a big uh, bottleneck for you. So unless you want to go to war with the Antigonids straight away, getting past Corinth is going to be annoying and uh, really hard to do. Which is kind of good because Corinth is, uh, once you've taken Corinth, you then bottleneck everyone else onto here. But at the start, it's quite a big bottleneck. So you're either going to have to ship your troops out. Or move your troops next to Corinth and then the next turn move them away. Which will be a transgression against the Antigonids, making them more likely to declare war on you. At the start as well, another negative is that you lack Phalangites. But you will get them after the Cleomenes reforms. So fighting against Phalangite armies is actually very difficult at the start. And I would recommend that you try and fight some of the nations that have less Phalangites. And have more of the Theroporoi, like the Achaean, Achaean, Achaean League. Right then, guys. Well, that is the generic positives and negatives over with. We will go into those a little bit more detail as we go along through the various uh, different sections. So let's move on to the building roster. All in all, guys, Sparta has a very complete and really good building roster. Like most Hellenic factions, you would expect them to have a very proficient building roster. The only places that you may say are lacking uh, are the highways. You cannot build highways and you can't go above irrigation um, or a dockyard. But I, I'm not too sure. Can the Romans go one more than irrigation? I'm not sure about that. Maybe the Romans can't. But those are... Uh, uh, the fact that you can't build highways is a little bit of a limiting factor, but paved roads are so good nonetheless that it doesn't matter too much. You also get access to grain imports, which is great, as well as the aqueducts. You don't get the uh, fourth level of public health building, so that's another slightly lacking. You do get access to the Ludus Magna, as we would expect, and the theatre, which gives gladiator gladiatorial games. So you, you have public happiness on lock. Now, in terms of your temples, the three temples that are available to the Spartans are the Shrine to Ares, which gives experience all the way along. We have the Shrine to Deimos and Phobos, which is a weapon and armor upgrade settlement, um, temple. So you want to use that in your uh, settlements that can build the blacksmith. And we have the third one, which is the Shrine to Hera. Which gives public order due to law and gives law all the way along. So that is one slight lacking thing in your building roster as a Hellenic faction, guys. You're much more focused on public happiness than law. Although the Ludus Magna does give law, um, the theatre doesn't and the Shrine to Hera does. So you're kind of lacking a bit of law compared to some of the Eastern or the Phoenician faction of Carthage that allows you to have the Execution Square um, and the Secret Police HQ line that gives you a lot of law. So in your faraway, faction, your faraway territories, you will be facing a little bit of corruption. However, this area in general, guys, is hugely, hugely populated with cities. And they are very close to where your capital city is, Sparta. So you're not going to face corruption for a very long time until you start getting up to here or into Greece or into Anatolia. So even though you don't have a huge amount of law, you won't need it until late mid-game to late game, guys. So that lack of law really doesn't matter too much for a faction like Sparta. 
Just a quick note on temples, guys. In case you haven't played RTR Imperium Serectum before, you get access to three. You can build level one of each one. But then after that, you must choose which one you want to upgrade. So if you are wanting law in a settlement, make sure you upgrade the shrine to Hera as the second building first. If you want any of the others, make sure you upgrade those because you can't upgrade them all in tandem. You can only get level one of each one. So that's that note out of the way. And I think that is everything. So obviously you are Sparta. You're more military focused than a lot of other factions. And that's why you get that benefit with those temples. I'd say overall very good temples. Having a law temple plus a temple to upgrade weapons and a temple for experience is really, really good. It allows you to fine tune your armies as much as possible. So that is great. That is really, really good. Right guys, on to the unit roster. And this is going to be in two sections as well because we're going to do pre-Cleomenes reforms to after Cleomenes reforms. So generally as Sparta, as you would expect, you have very good infantry. So if we go on to the uh, Hyparchia, you can see our full roster pre-Cleomenes reforms here. But a few of these remain throughout and we'll go over those first. So the Cryptia, they will remain throughout after the Cleomenes reforms as well. Kind of your militia unit. 31 defense, 13 morale, which is actually pretty decent. Um, they can swim as well. No armor, however, but 7 shield. So they will be very vulnerable to archers, even with that 7 shield and 1 armor. Because a lot of archers in this game tend to have over 8, um, over eight missile attack. If we look at our healer archers, in fact, they have 10. But as I say, most archers in this game have over 8 missile attacks. So these guys will be dying as soon as they get hit by missiles. So don't get them into missile fight. In fact, you really want to avoid these guys apart from very early game or as um, units, as garrisons. So don't really use these guys. These guys especially cannot hold up late game, guys. Do not use them late game. They will be getting shredded, I promise you. Any fa any um, any um, unit with a bit of armor will just shred these guys. So please do not use them. There's also something with the game. I believe it's in Medieval 2 as well. Where spearmen really don't hold up the same as swordsmen in melee. So that melee attack 12 seems reasonably decent. But the animation for a spearman actually is worse than a swordsman so therefore they do less damage than that would suggest so the next unit that you have all the way through guys is the skiratai slightly better version of the cryptia they have 31 defense 17 morale so a lot better morale and 13 melee attack one better melee attack a decent charge as well seven shield and one armor again so very little armor so again they will get shredded by missiles especially javelins from Theroperoi or from the Romans, for example. But pretty good defense skill overall. 23, 31 defense. They're just a decent early game unit. An okay early game mid-tier mid unit. They can swim as well. Uh, and they are swordsmen. So they will do slightly more damage than the Cryptia. And be hold for a lot longer with that extra morale. And they're the whole way through. But as I say, guys, these guys will not hang a hat in late game so don't use them late game please guys please right the next unit that we have all the way through is the spartan cavalry they're not a good cavalry unit guys they're a pretty terrible cavalry unit overall only 13 morale 11 alt attack is okay it's it's not good though but 20 defense is absolutely awful for cavalry so if you don't know about cavalry when you charge them in because their hitbox is so large they tend to take a lot of damage on a charge that's why when you send cavalry units into a charge certain amount of them will die on the charge just automatically anyway but this is very heavily influenced by how much defense they have and as you can see 
The Spartan cavalry has basically no defense. 20 defense is awful. 27 charges is, is, is not great either. It's it's okay for a cavalry unit. It's okay. It's, it's not great. So these guys, they're good for running down routing troops. They're good for charging into the back of the enemy, making sure that they can't hit you back. And good for har harrying uh, missile troops. But any prolonged fight or cavalry on cavalry fights... These guys will not be good. I am using them late game in my campaign, however, uh, but they don't hold up. But I've had to, you know, fill the armies with like six of these guys just so that they can deal with a couple of cavalry units uh, on the opposition, on the enemy's side. Now, you also get access to Helot Slingers and Helot Archers. Let's, we won't cover the Slingers. that. Yeah, they're trash. <laughs> they're not great. 11 defense is, is really bad. Uh, four shield and one armor, they will just die to any missile attacks. And three morale is basically if the enemy stands next to them, they will rout. It's similar situation when we come across to the healer archers, because they only have four morale. So these guys will break almost instantly, guys. However, the missile attack of ten is pretty decent. And as you know, as soon as you start getting these guys experience, they will start dealing some real damage. Um... Missile range of 130, so not long-range missiles, which is a slightly unfortunate, and 30 ammunition, which is decent. But all archers and all missile troops in this game have some value in this mod, have some value. And I'm still using these guys late game because once you've got them a bit of an armor upgrade and a bit of experience, they do actually start to shred because every experience gives them an extra missile attack. Once they're at the first silver experience, that's 14 missile attack, guys. 14. So using these guys is fine. Just don't let them have any morale shocks because they will run. They will go. They will completely get out of there. Now, let's uh, talk about... We could uh, we can have a look at the Siege Engines. You get access to Ballista, the Lithobolo, and the Large Lithobolo, which is an area attack. It's it's fine. They work. They work. Uh, decent Siege Engines. You don't get access to Onagers, but uh, it's fine. You don't really need Onagers, I would say. Uh, Onagers can speed up your Sieges, but they slow down your armies, just like all Siege equipment. So... Uh, using Onagers has never been a huge um, benefit for me, to be honest. But there is siege equipment there if you want. Now, the other units that you have access to before the Cleomenes reforms are all replaced. So, the Helot Javelin men are replaced. The Spartan uh, Spartan General stays around. But the Spartan Homoioi and the Sp Perioikoi Hoplitai uh, are replaced by Phalangites. So, if we look at the Perioikoi Hoplitai... He's got a total defense of 36, which is pretty good, in fact. 11 morale, which isn't great. Isn't great, as we talked about before. And a melee attack of 12, which is okay. But it, again, it's a spear-wielding unit. So that melee attack is actually less against a sword, uh, sword-wielding unit, if I'm right about that. A charge of 13. 8 shield and 7 armor. So your first unit with a bit of armor, so they're not going to die to missiles quite so readily although 15 missile defense sometimes might not be enough against javelin men for them not to die instantly because some of the theroporoi etc throwing their javis might have more missile attack than that if they get a bit of experience but overall a pretty decent mid-level unit now the other unit that you have access to before the cleomenes reforms is the spartan homoioi which has a 46 defense 8 shield, 16 charge, 31 defense skill, guys. 46 total defense, 7 armor. Ah, oh, great. 20 morale, 50 melee attack. An excellent, excellent infantry unit, guys. And they look just stunning. They look absolutely beautiful, especially on the battlefield. So, guys, these guys are awesome. These guys are really good. However, big <laughs> negative to these guys, how did you know that was coming, is that you can only train them... Uh, once you get to large city and as you can see Sparta starts off as a minor city but only with 3,500 population guys like basically nothing so it's very very likely you will get the Cleomenes reforms before you can even train those homoioi as long as you're being aggressive in your attacks now the general the Spartan general which you get for non uh, you get late game instead of the uh, cavalry general um, for non 
family members, I believe. I believe it's non-family members. Uh, but it re is replaced by the Spartan Cavalry General once you get going. And they will serve as your basically your only good cavalry until you can get the Thessalian Lancers that we talked about before, guys. But they are very good. They are a very, very, very strong infantry unit, guys. 49 defense, 24 morale will hardly ever break. 19 melee attack and 18 alt attack. So they have a sword of alt attack of 18. Uh, a charge of 13, shield and armor, both of 8, defense skill of 33. Very, very decent unit. And you want to throw these guys in to hold the line where you can. Uh, because they will hold the line for almost ever. Like the uh, like Leonidas at Thermopylae. They are very, very decent indeed. Right guys, I will join you after a lovely here's one I made earlier transition into my Sparta campaign later on after the Cleomenes reforms. Here's one I made earlier. So guys, here we are as Sparta after a while. If you want to know how we got to that this point, please watch the uh, campaign. I don't want to give too many spoilers away, so I'll try and keep down here. But you can see there are very different, very different units on offer now so let's have a look at some of these uh, and they replaced the uh porioikoi hominai uh hoplitai and the spartan homoioi so as we can see we have still the helot archers still the helot slingers but the javelin men are changed to the uzonoi basically they're just a slightly more armored and more morale version of the helot javelin men so not Huge excitement there for those guys. Same siege equipment. Same cavalry that we talked about. The Spartan cavalry. Uh, same Cryptia. And same Skiritai. But two new units. Phalangites guys. Phalanx units. Really good Phalanx units. So here we have the Perioikoi Phalangites. Jitas. The uh, Spartan hold the line. Middle of the range Phalangite unit. 15 morale. Pretty good. Pretty okay. Well... Not amazing, but okay. It's pretty decent. 18 melee attacks. Actually, very good for a phalanx unit, guys. 37 defense is okay again. But as I say, 15 armor and shield together might not always be enough to stop javelins killing these guys on their first throw. Defense skill of 22, pretty decent. But with the phalanxes, of course, you want to hold that enemy at bay. Obviously, their charge is very low. They should not be charging in. And their alt attack of 9 is terrible. So you want them in phalanx pretty much all the time. But as I say, a pretty decent mid-level um, phalanx unit. And they will hold the line for a very long time. Very long spears as well. It says powerful charge. So some of these guys up here, excellent morale and powerful charge. Good stamina. Uh, it's because, obviously, in the base game, like, 8 charge would be very good for a unit. But because the stats are altered, then it's not a good charge. It just it just puts this up here as part of the script. Uh, so let's have a look at the elite Phalangites, guys. The elite ones that you can get at large city level. The Neo Damodeus Phalangites. Fantastic. These guys are really good. 39 defense, 18 morale. So 3 more morale than the other ones. 19 melee attack, one more melee attack, one more alt attack, and a couple more defense. How much more defense was it? So they had 39, 37, so two more defense. It doesn't sound like a lot, guys, but on a phalangite unit, it's actually quite considerable amount more. A lot of that comes from the defense skill, however, so the shield is only five this time, and the armor's only seven. So these guys may actually die more to missiles than the mid-level guys, but they are just better overall, and they will hold the line a lot longer. Now, your other option that you can get over here, uh, which you get as a general, is your Spartan Cavalry Bodyguard. 38 defense, a lot better than your Spartan Cavalry, but still not amazing. But 53 charge, guys, is absolutely brutal. Really good. 21 uh, melee attack. 13 melee attack and 15 alt attack, which is excellent. The 13 melee attack with your primary weapon is predominantly what you want to get on charge. And then they will go on to 15 alt attack with a sword that you can see there, guys, when they're in extended combat. So a pretty, pretty decent uh, cavalry unit. 17 armor. The one thing is they're not that fast, of course, because of how armored they are. But they're still probably faster than a cataphract or something like that. So a very good cavalry uh, unit, and that's something that you're going to have to be using a lot 
if uh, if you are uh, wanting to do cavalry charges, because your Spartan cavalry, as I say, is just not good enough. However, if we move this guy into Larissa, let's see whether any of the Thessalian Lancers are available. So you want to come into Larissa, guys, and get these guys rather than your Spartan cavalry, because as you can see, they have a whole 10 defense more, more morale, more melee attack, more alt attack, and 47 charge, guys. A very, very strong charge. And these guys are faster than your general as well. So they won't last too long in extended combat because of that defense. But that charge of 47 is brilliant for charging into the enemy. So that's what you want to get rather than your Spartan Cavalry every time these guys come available. Right, I think that's a pretty comprehensive view of the units, guys. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, for me, that was comprehensive anyway. So let's uh, go back. Go back in time to the start of the game and we'll talk about how to start guys how to get your economy going how to do the uh, take the as much land as possible and what alliances to look for as well right guys i will see you in a second hi welcome back certainly glad you could join me today and we'll just start making little crisscross strokes and that's good enough for today all of us here i'd like to wish you happy painting and god bless my friend this is Sparta! Right, guys. Here with the magic of editing, we are back at this start. And let's talk about how you want to start. Probably the part that a lot of you are here for in general. Um, so, you start with Sparta, of course. And we've talked about that already. 3,500 population. Uh, but it is classed as a minor city, allowing you to get the Perioikoi Hoplitae to start with. Now, you start with your economy in a pretty terrible place. 2,232 minus 5,000 uh, out of 5,000. But basically, what you want to do is you have a spy and you have a diplomat. Now, use those to your advantage, guys. A completely use those to your advantage. And on top of that, you want to spend all of your money on the first turn. Because if you don't do that, you are just going to be losing money that you could have spent otherwise. So, what I would recommend initially is to go on to very high to stop the bleeding just a little bit. How much difference was it? It's about 300 difference, right? So, 300 difference, pretty good. But on top of that, your population growth is going to go down quite considerably. Now... What you will also want to do in terms of your economy and building. So build. Choose what you want to build, guys. I would recommend the land clearance because it's pretty cheap. And if we look here, it gives you 550 extra a turn just from a 600 uh, building, guys. 600. Now, at this point, you can decide whether you want to, you know, queue another building. You could queue one more building. Um, although not a lot of them are hugely, hugely beneficial to you right away. The paved roads might get you some money. But as you can see, it looks like it's reducing your money. But that it will be a good investment overall in the future because of the uh, trade that's going to flow through your Greek lands, guys. I would build the land clearance. To me, I would build the land clearance and probably nothing else. Because initially, you're not really trading with anyone. Um, unless you get a load of trade agreements on the first couple of turns. The uh, trade is not going to be hugely useful. As you can see. It's actually a reduction in money because we have no trade agreements right now. Uh, and nowhere else to trade with. We are just Sparta ourselves. It does look actually like we are trading with Athens. So maybe we are trading a little bit. But it's not really increasing trade enough. So, building the land clearance is the first thing that you want to do. And then I would recommend, so this is up to you. If you want to queue another building after that, queue another building. But make sure you've got enough money to buy at least one Perioikoi Hoplitae. I would buy three. That This is how I would set up, guys. I would buy three. So you have reinforcements coming to your army straight away. Then, get your spy into either Argos or Megalopolis. They will succeed because they're pretty good. Take out your general and your units. Get them in there and besiege Argos. And luckily, if you're lucky, the gates will open. If not, you will have to siege it down. Um, so you will siege this down. And then as soon as you've done this, they have a 
relatively tough garrison, guys, with Greek generals as bodyguards, but use your generals as much as you will allow without getting your generals killed. But you should be able to take both Argos and Megalopolis, Megalopolis in one or two turns. So once you've ended the turn, you can take this, then move across, leave behind probably the Helot Javelin men, then move across to Megalopolis and take that. Once you've taken these three guys, your economy will be almost stable. On top of this, what you want to do is you want to go around and talk to as many people as possible. Early game, if I was you, I would take an alliance with almost anyone that you can. Because all these Greek cities, their alliances and wars continuously change. And if you can just have an alliance for a few turns, it stops them attacking you. But if I was you... I would ideally go for an alliance with the Antigones, which you can see on Hard Hard is generous right now, generous and they accept. That is fantastic, because the Antigones are the biggest uh, people in this area. If you can get an alliance with them and keep it for a while, you should be able to get to the point where you're then large enough, enough to take them on yourselves. Please remember that Kyrene and Rhodes are both excellent settlements. Rhodes is especially good, guys. So once you've taken these three, beat the Achaeans off. Then, if you do manage to have an alliance with the Antigonids and maintain it, Athens will likely come for you. So, deal with Athens or go for Rhodes. Rhodes itself is an amazing settlement, guys, and makes a huge amount of trade income. And I'm talking a huge amount of trade income. On top of that, the Colossus of Rhodes increases trade by 40%. So gunning for that early game is a huge boon to you. So that is how I would start. Now, one thing we haven't really talked about initially with the Spartans is the fact that most of these places that you're taking early game have the same culture as you. So you can actually occupy a lot of them and not have cultural unrest, which is a big problem in this mod for you when you are forcibly taking settlements of different cultures. So you do actually have a very good start because up to about here is probably Greek culture. And then we start getting into build buildings that are uh, Western Hellenic rather than, say... Uh, Greek, which is what we have. Yeah. So then you will have a bit more cultural unrest, unrest with the Antigonid provinces than you will uh, some of these other Greek settlements down here. But you can pretty much occupy if you want to keep your economy ticking over. Or I would recommend enslaving so that you can get the Spartan growth going as soon as possible. Uh, now, one thing to note, guys. Although Sparta is your capital, it's going to be very, very, very... And I, <laughs> I underline very hard for you to grow this settlement because this is your main recruitment hub. So you're going to be recruiting from here most of the game. So getting it up to a large city is going to be incredibly tough, especially with this uh, population growth. But as soon as you can reduce it down to low, do so so that you get yeah, that growth going for you as well. Now, with that, guys, with that population growth of Sparta being hampered by recruitment... I would, early game, try and build out a recruitment hub somewhere else. Somewhere that has a lot of population that you're not too bothered about growing. Ideally, somewhere that is already a large city, which uh, some of these places will get to relatively quickly. So, build up another recruitment hub so you can take the pressure off Sparta and allow it to grow itself. That's something I didn't do in my Let's Play that I wished I had done earlier. I've only just started building up some recruitment hubs elsewhere where we can recruit nice units. So guys, I think that's pretty much everything. So yes, let's just to reiterate, Sparta is a brilliant faction, a very good faction, really good infantry, especially after the Cleomenes reforms. And you start in a good position, a pretty decent position. Now, this mod is supposed to be hard, guys. So if you are having trouble with it, just bump that difficulty down a little bit. Even I, I play very hard on vanilla, and it's pretty easy for me. And I played very hard on this mod, and I got ruined. So 
I played on Hard Hard, and I would recommend Hard Hard if you're an experienced player, and the game is actually balanced for Hard Hard. If you're finding Hard Hard too hard, go down to normal and see how it is. If it's too hard again, go down to easy. But as I say, this mod is designed to be hard, guys. And the only way that you can uh, combat your economy crumbling at the start is going and conquering. Conquer those two, then go to Kaidonia and Rhodes, or make a beeline straight for Rhodes. But please be warned, Rhodes probably will have a pretty decent garrison, so you want a little bit of an army before you get there. Right, guys. Well, I think that's everything for today. I hope you enjoyed. Please comment down below any questions you have or any suggestions you might have for new players trying to play as Sparta as well. So thank you very much, guys. Please like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And always remember... This is Sparta!